At this point, you will not be looking for love from people. You will be giving out love to people. In today's video, I want to speak about life lessons from Judges 11. Overcoming your weakness with faith and courage. Number one, the presence of weakness in your life does not lessen who you are. We have someone here in this chapter named Jephthah. And in his story, you can see that he had a weakness, even though this weakness was not directly from him, but then it has affected his life. But still in the passage, the way God sees him is different from the way he is perceived in his environment by his family. It's even different from the way he perceives himself. Verse 1 of the chapter it says, Now Jephthah was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. How many times in our life that things could be said about you and birth coming? Is a wise person birth this? Is a good person birth this? I want to let you know in this video, through the life lesson of Jephthah, that your weakness does not lessen who you are. The fact that he was born by a prostitute did not make him not become a great warrior, even though that was used against him. So Jephthah, like many of us, did not choose his own weakness. Most of us, we came through bloodlines of people who had trauma and they end up passing down the trauma. We came from bloodline of people who had anger issues and they end up passing that down. We came from bloodline of people who were mediocre and they end up passing that down the line and we find that to become our limitation, our weakness. But in Jephthah's life, the fact that he was born by a prostitute, which became a stigma to him, his mother was a prostitute. What a title, what a name about your origin, oh, son of a prostitute. That could make him feel down, that could make him feel dejected. And in our lives, we have weaknesses of all sorts. But this lesson is for you to know, no matter your weakness in life, it does not lessen who you are. It does not make less of who God made you to be. Because God already made Jephthah to become a ruler, even though it did not yet play out in his immediate life. Even though the circumstances of his life did not line up to prove that he will become that ruler. So your weakness does not lessen your potential. It does not lessen who God made you to be. It does not limit you. It does not set the bar for where you can get in life. So instead of sitting down somewhere and whining about, oh, this weakness, if God can just take it away, if God can just make me strong in this area or that area, I would like you to be like Paul. When he was asking God, take away this weakness from me, God told him, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So I want you to know this, that your weakness gives you an opportunity to embrace God's grace. It's an opportunity for you to go for God's grace. When you are weak, all you need is God's grace. Instead of whining, complaining, crying, and sitting there in your weakness, embrace the grace of God. That's all you need. Lesson two, your experience of rejection does not disqualify you from reaching and fulfilling your divine destiny. Jephthah was to become a ruler in Gilead. But then, because of his background and his story, being born by a prostitute, his brethren cast him out of the house. In verse 2 it says, Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. I know that experience of rejection can actually make you blame yourself. Why me? What is happening? What did I do? wrong. I believe Jephthah would have asked himself, I did not put myself in this situation. I did not put myself in this predicament. I did not make myself to come from a prostitute. But then it has become a part of his story and he was rejected by his people. But you need to know that in life, relating with people and walking through life, you might get to be rejected by people. The fact that somebody rejects you does not mean that God rejects you. The fact that you are rejected and offer for an employment does not mean that God has rejected you, nothing good will come to you. The fact that family rejects you, or maybe friends, or maybe in a relationship, from a place of deficit, you are chasing someone and the person rejects you. That doesn't mean God has rejected you. Your rejection does not set the bar for where you can get in life and for you to fulfill destiny. So am I trying to say that rejection feels good? No, it doesn't feel good. But all I'm trying to say is that your rejection is not disqualification. If you are rejected from someone, maybe you were asking for a romantic relationship, 
that doesn't disqualify you like maybe you're not worthy to date or you're not worthy to marry because somebody rejected you or you're not worthy for this or that you're not worthy for any job you are not disqualified you should learn from this Jephthah was rejected and cast out by his brethren his rejection created an opportunity for him to experience God's purpose in his life and that is the lesson I want you to pick here that God has a way of turning your rejection to an opportunity for your breakthrough God has a way and you can't tell down this chapter it says the elder said come and be our commander help us fight the Ammonites but Jephthah said to them aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house why do you come to me now when you are in trouble because we need you the elders replied so most times you might be rejected and God has a purpose for that rejection because he wants to turn that rejection to an opportunity for your breakthrough had it been Jephthah was still with them in the house they would not have given him the regard they gave him to be their commander it would just have been oh it's your duty since you are a great fighter just fight for us help us but now because of the rejection he now has a voice to decide what he wants if you read that passage he told him if i come back what am i going to get from this now he can decide and they said you're going to be our ruler but of course he ruled over them any rejection you face in life from anybody whether it's a parent a family member a lover whosoever it is that rejection does not disqualify you from fulfilling your purpose in life and reaching destiny lesson three your feelings of insignificance does not make you insignificant sometimes you might just feel unimportant and insignificant in life because you feel like i'm not where i ought to be i'm not where i want to be i'm not where i'm supposed to be those feelings of insignificance does not make you as a person to be insignificant in verse three of that chapter he said, so Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. For Jephthah to have company of worthless people, fugitives, following him, it means he was seen as one. Because the leader of worthless people is also a worthless person. Jephthah found himself in a place where he felt insignificant. And that created an opportunity for these fugitives, these worthless people, who saw themselves as worthless also to rally around him and he became their leader so maybe you're feeling insignificant because of your story because of the stigma around you because of your weakness because of the rejection but you are not insignificant god did not make you to be an insignificant person the scripture says you are unique fearfully and wonderfully made the fact that you not function in who you are yet doesn't make you insignificant the fact that a phone is in the store not being used for what it's supposed to be used for does not make the phone insignificant because when somebody purchases that phone it will be used to its optimum capacity same thing with you by the time god lays his hands on you and makes you walk in the lane of your destiny your functions will now be seen by all but the fact that they are not seen now doesn't make it insignificant before jesus could even do one miracle one miracle the father in heaven told him you are my beloved son in you i am well pleased he was already validated his significance was not based on what he could do or what he could not do he was already important to the father so all you need is your father in heaven's recommendation his commendation is validation you don't need validation from any other person you don't need your brothers or sisters your family your friends to validate you on whatsoever God has called you to do in this life. If you're waiting for that validation from people you know, you might not really get to where you ought to be in life. So all you need, like scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now I want you to see a cycle here. First, God. Second, you. Third, people, your neighbor, and every other person. It means... If you're looking for validation this is the cycle of validation you get to god first and receive validation from him receive commendation from him receive the love you need from him receive the strength and the grace you need from him from there you can now love yourself you can now be stable you can now be who you are supposed to be and do your work with excellence and with this place that you come from you can now give love to others it should not be on the reverse because most times believers live in the reverse whereby they go to people
to look for validation. They go to relationships to look for validation. They go to jobs to look for validation. And at the end of the day, they fail. These things doesn't feel. These people cannot make their soul satisfied. They feel dejected and all sort of insignificant feelings. So your validation should not be tied to your work, to your family, to your loved ones, to your spouse or anybody at all. Get your validation from God. Once you get that from God, first validate yourself through the love that you receive from God. Know yourself and love yourself and care for yourself. At this point, you will not be looking for love from people. You will be giving out love to people. You will be giving out encouragement to people. You will be of help to people and this is where you find your significance. You don't find your significance in trying to get people to love you. You don't find your significance in trying to get people to talk good about you. The feelings that you might feel like, oh, I'm not significant, I'm not important. That is a lie from the enemy. Lesson four, your faith is not defined by how stable you feel. I know sometimes when we are asking something of God or when we are expecting something in faith, we try to check with our feelings first. Your faith does not need your feelings. Your faith is to go with the word of God, with what God said. What did God say? If I'm asking God for healing, what did he say? If I'm asking God for breakthrough, what did he say? I go with his word, not with how I feel. So if you are in a place that you are believing God for something and you don't feel so sure, you are in the right place. Because most times, faith does not line with feelings. You will not feel that confident, that convicted. You don't have to wait for the feeling to validate your faith. You go with the word of God. If God say he will make an open door for you, then go with that. That is all you need. It's just that is word. In Hebrews 11, Jephthah was named among those people who did exploit with their faith. But then in this passage in Judges, we don't really see where Jephthah expressed faith because it seemed like he actually expressed fear and he was trying to bargain with God. But now I want to let you know that your faith is proven that in your weakness, you can trust God to use you to do mighty things, to do exploits, because that was what happened in the case of Jephthah. And let's read that scripture in Hebrews. How much more do I need to say it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. Their weakness was turned to strength. Now, that is where faith is expressed. I know I'm weak. I know in and of myself I cannot do anything. But then I'm still stepping out in faith, believing that God will walk through me. And that is faith. Faith doesn't need to be me coming to a place of stable feelings. I'm so confident. That will come to self-confidence and not God-confidence. So if my feelings need to come to a place of total agreement with God, maybe you apply for something or you did something and you are so pompous and confident like this is going to work. Just like the case of a student writing exams and just coming out of the exams all and be like, I really rose, like I did my best, like I know that I'm going to come out with the best. And at the end of the day, when the results comes out, Somebody don't even make it. You don't need to come off in your faith with that self-confidence. God doesn't need that. You need God confidence. I know that God will do this. I know that God will make the way. I know that God will walk through me. I know that through my weakness, God's strength will be expressed. So you can say to yourself, even though I feel fear, I will walk in faith. Even though I feel doubt, I will walk in faith. Even though my mind cannot comprehend all of these things that are happening, I will walk in faith. I will trust God. Lesson number five from Judges 11. Do not vow to God as a transaction to get God to do what you need from him. Now I need to correct this about making vows to God because this is one of the lessons that you need to take importance about this Jephthah story and something you should not repeat. Do not make a vow to God as if you are entering into a transaction with him to get him to do what you need from him. That was the error that Jephthah made. He entered a vow and told God, if you will give me victory. Did God not want to give him victory? Or did it mean that it's that vow that will make God give him victory? Because that, that is what that represents. When you tell God, if you do this for me, I will do this for you. That's a transaction. That's no more a relationship. You're missing it. And most times growing up, they used to teach this, make a vow to God. And then people come up with trying to make vows to God so that God will do something for them, they end up becoming the unhappiest people. That happened to Jephthah. After he made his vow, yeah, he went for the battle. God gave him victory. But did God give him victory because he made a vow? No. So you don't need to come to this place that 
Even when God gives you a victory, you cannot enjoy that victory because you are unhappy. It seems like God has taken something of value from you to give you something. No, that's not a picture of God. Because most times it will look like you need to bring this so that God can do this. If you're making vows to God, your vow should come from a place of understanding that this is my commitment to God. It's a relationship. I'm committed in this relationship. This is my commitment. I'm giving you my life. If you are giving him your life, I want to save you forever. This is my commitment. Not based on what you should or can do for me. I'm just doing this because I understand who you are. I trust your person. So I'm passionate about this because I feel like so many people have been exploited in the area of make a vow to God so that God will do something for you. And most times it is this story of Jephthah because he actually gained victory. So he use it. You no, know, God doesn't want to give you a victory that brings you unhappiness. God actually wants you to enjoy and celebrate your victory. If it brings victory to your life, it makes you to overcome your addictions. He wants you to celebrate it. Not for you. After he has given you victory, you will become unhappy. Be like, oh no, I did not expect this. Because he actually blamed his daughter. Oh, you've destroyed me. But she was just innocently celebrating. Now let's get to this. What was in Jephthah's mind when he told God, I will give you a vow that anything that comes out to meet me first. He was expecting maybe an animal to come out. He wasn't expecting his daughter to come out, definitely. But that would have been a bad trade with God. Like this is a transaction. It would have been a very bad trade with God, a bad transaction. Like God is losing. So now, the value of this animal with the victory that I've given you if we are to enter into a transaction doesn't meet up. And this is where we need to come to a place of understanding that there's nothing we can give to God that can measure up with his blessings and his goodness in our lives before we start getting into transaction with him. God did not even want us to come to a place that we want to express transaction with him. Like, God, if you do this, I will do this. If you do that, I will do the third. No. And I remember for myself personally, there was a time I was struggling with my addiction. And I told God, Lord, if you just save me from this, I'm going to sing for you forever. I'm going to do this for you forever. Those were good things to say, but then it is not because of that that God will bring me victory. God will not wait to consider your vow before he does something for you. Your singing that you do is actually for you. Your going to church is for you. Your study of the scripture is for you. Everything you do, which supposedly we feel like we are doing this to God, it is for us. Our serving God is for us. Being in God's presence is for our good because it helps us remind ourselves of who God is, of his presence with us, and it helps encourage us to take life again and succeed. Without God, we wouldn't even make it up to where we are right now. So it is not like we are doing God a favor to serve him. We are doing God a favor to sing for him. We are doing God a favor to go to church, to do this and that. If you are thinking that way, you have the wrong thinking. That is why you need to come to Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Renew your mind. Jephthah already had an experience with God in verse 29. The scripture says, At that time, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And from there, he laid an army against the Ammonites. This is before he even made his vow. The Spirit of God was already upon him. Maybe Jephthah thought that the Spirit of God that came upon him wasn't enough. So he said, God, if you give me victory. So here's me telling you, don't try to bargain a transaction with God to get God to do something for you. All you need to know is that his love is enough. His grace is enough. His strength is enough. His spirit is enough. His presence is all you need. God doesn't want any flesh to boast in his presence. Scripture says, He chose the lowly, the lovable in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent, so that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. You need to grab this. It is a thing of pride for you to think it is until I make a vow to God that God will do a certain thing for me. You are looking for a reason to boast. It's because of the vow I made to God. That's why God gave me this. That's why God made me to have a breakthrough. No, no, no. Who are you deceiving? So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it has been of value to you and you've taken something of value from these lessons from Judges 11. I would like you to go through that scripture and tell me what other lessons you're picking from it. To be a pleasure to read your comment. Thank you so much. God bless you.